All right, Paige Castellan graduated with her degree in electrical engineering from Virginia Tech in 2015. Castellan, a Pittsburgh native, always had an interest in using her creativity to solve problems that eventually led her to the field of engineering. In 2016, Castellan had the opportunity of a lifetime to put her electrical engineering skills to use as a member of the ground crew for Solar Impulse 2, the world's first solar-powered airplane to circumnavigate the globe. In this role, she traveled for six months from Hawaii to Abu Dhabi, UAE, with the ground crew to help Solar Impulse 2 complete its historic flight around the globe. Her experience with Solar Impulse not only gave her the opportunity to apply her electrical engineering background in a new and exciting way, but it also marked the beginning of Castlin's role as a spokesperson for young students in STAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. As the youngest, the only female engineer, and the only American on the ground crew of the first solar plane to circumnavigate the globe, the world without fuel, Paige has already redefined gender barriers in engineering at the age of 25. Her story has showcased around the country, profiling her passionate work as a female in STEM, including Forbes, Glamour, and the Huffington Post. In 2017, she was selected to be part of the exclusive Forbes 30 Under 30 list in the energy sector. After Solar Impulse 2, Castellan found her passion for autonomous vehicles. She noticed a diversity gap in this new and emerging field and has challenged herself to showcase the field's diversity by speaking at various autonomous vehicle conferences. To, she believes that there will be dramatic changes in the automotive industry and to ensure the future of mobility is built to meet the needs of everyone, there must be a diverse group involved in the developmental process. Currently, Castlin is pursuing a Master of Information System Management at Carnegie Mellon University and hopes to use this degree to follow her passion with the future of mobility. So please welcome Paige Castlin. Here we go. Just gonna take a minute to get set up real quick. All right, hi everybody. I am so excited to be here with you all today, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of my experience as a young woman going through college, entering into the workforce, and then some tips that I've gained along the way to help make the impossible possible. All right, so students are my absolute favorite group to speak to because it wasn't so long ago that I was right in your shoes. Eight years ago, I was packing up my car getting ready to head off to Virginia Tech where I was pursuing my degree in electrical engineering. And I was doing exactly what you're doing. Now I know all of you aren't going into your first year, but I do know every single person in this room is a high achiever. You are doing everything you can to ensure that you're gonna graduate from Robert Morris and you're going to be a well-rounded woman ready to totally rock the world. So I, wanna, I want you guys to give yourself an applause for just being amazing. There we go. All right, so throughout my eight years, or throughout my eight years, really, eight years ago, when I was getting ready for my first year, like I said, I was doing everything to ensure that I was going to graduate and be a well-rounded individual. I was a part of a sorority. I was in an engineering club. I was on a design team. I was in a mentorship program. And I even found some time to join the Virginia Tech scuba diving club, which was pretty fun. All of those different things made me who I was. And I wanted to ensure that after four years, I was gonna graduate and be the best version of myself. So four years later, as I was graduating, I felt like I accomplished that. And I thought, okay, I'll get a normal job. That didn't really happen though, as you heard from my bio. So six months into my first job, I received notice that my company was looking for an electrical engineer to represent our organization on a project that we partnered with called Solar Impulse 2. And that was the world's first solar powered airplane to fly around the world only using the power of the sun. What a dream job, right? I was like, please sign me up. But to get the job, I had to write a 300 word essay to the North American leadership team of my company explaining why I should be selected. So I wrote about this. This is my solar panel phone charging purse. That's a mouthful to say, so I'm glad I didn't stutter when I just said that. But what happened was I was at a conference and it was a few months after I graduated and I saw a woman with a, a similar purse at, and I went over and said, what does that purse do? I know this solar panel is probably not just a blinged out accessory. What does this purse do? 
And she told me that it stores the sun's energy to charge her cell phone. So I immediately went home from the conference. Well, I finished up the conference. And then I went home, immediately ordered my electronics, and built my own solar panel phone charging purse. You guys could probably assume what I did next. I dragged my sister to downtown Pittsburgh, where I made her take a dramatic Instagram photo shoot of me with my purse, where I was posing really dramatically. <laughs> I got the money shot. I posted it on Instagram. And I immediately started hearing comments from people saying, where can I buy that? Now, this was interesting for me, because when I saw the woman with the solar panel on her purse, I thought, how can I make that? And that was the mentality that landed me the job of Solar Impulse. When you're working on a project that was thought to be impossible, having that mindset of creative problem solving and innovation was exactly what the project needed. And I was very thankful I was selected for this opportunity because, like I said, I thought I was just going to have a normal career. But I was wrong. So with that, I want to tell you five things that I never thought I would do when I graduated with my degree. Whoops. All right, so number one, I never thought I would be asked to ride an electric bicycle at 40 miles an hour down an airport runway chasing a solar-powered airplane as it landed. Most people never think they're going to do that, but it was pretty cool. Number two, I never thought I would be in Hawaii with a bunch of Swiss people eating uh, Swiss fondue and blasting yodeling music. Number three, I never thought I would meet the Prince of Monaco. Four, I never thought my job would take me to a country like Egypt, where I would have the opportunity to ride a camel around the pyramids. And then finally, number five, I never thought I would have the opportunity to share my story in different magazines and to people just like you, the next generation of innovators. Now, after my job with Solar Impulse, you kind of heard about this, where I found my next passion with the future of mobility. And I remember at the end of Solar Impulse when I was standing on the airport runway in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, getting ready to um, catch the wing of the solar powered airplane, which I'll explain in a second, and just realizing that this project shattered all of the boundaries of what I thought was possible for number one, alternative energy, and then number two, my career. So a little bit about my job with Solar Impulse. When I walked into the hangar for the first time, the hangar is where we stored our airplane, I saw this. And it was this dragonfly-like structure. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I don't want to blink too hard or accidentally sneeze, and then the whole thing come crumbling to the ground. But that wasn't a sustainable attitude because you know, I was an engineer on this project. I was supposed to be in charge of taking it on and off the runway. So I had to gain that confidence quickly. Solar Impulse was a project that was born in Switzerland. So the team was majority from the French speaking, or French speaking part of Switzerland. And the project was not really to redefine how we power airplanes that travel around the world. The project was to start getting people to say, why not? Why not use solar energy for things? Why not use different types of alternative energy for things? And that's what we did. So as a member of the ground crew, I had a couple roles. And every day before we took a flight, I would get the sheet that told me what my role was going to be for the day. And I want to go through some of those roles I had, because number one, they're kind of crazy. And number two, it will help give you guys some context for some stories I'll tell later. <coughs> so I could be asked to pull the 5,100 pound airplane onto the runway. I didn't have to do it alone because 5,100 pounds is a lot. Um, it's about the same weight as a traditional SUV. And now Solar Impulse had the wingspan of just a traditional airplane. So imagine how different this plane was. You know, it was one of those traditional airplanes you would fly on, except for I was able to pull it out onto the runway. Pretty crazy. I could be asked to hold up the wing, or kind of keep it balanced and stabilized, because the wings were massive. So 236 feet. Think of two basketball courts side by side. 
and the wheels were tandem like a bicycle. So we all know when a bike's moving, you're not gonna fall over, but once you stop, you risk falling. The only challenge was if these wings fell, it wasn't you just scrape your knee or something. There were 17,000 solar cells that lined the wings of the plane. So if I was not there holding onto that handling mass, making sure it didn't fall, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> now, just as I said, if you're riding a bike, you're fine if you're moving. And once you stop, that's when you risk falling. So another one of my jobs was to stand on the side of the runway as the planes were taking off and landing. And then I was supposed to run, avoid the propellers, grab onto this handling mast, and stabilize the wings. Again, I was like, what on earth? That's what you want me to do? And especially operating on a team where I was told this in kind of broken French. I was thinking, oh my gosh, like, I can't Google this, I can't YouTube this. We are writing the textbook for how this is done, and I have to figure it out. Another thing I would do is kind of guide the tail of the airplane onto the runway. And the reason I wanted to explain this a little bit is you can see this little cart that we have. So the tail wheel was about this big, pretty tiny, thinking about an airplane just landing on this and then another wheel in the front. So as an engineer, we always had to come up with quick solutions for how we could you know, ensure that this would happen safely. So we had this little cart. There were a couple times throughout the project where I needed to go to Home Depot or Radio Shack and pick up some components, and they would always ask me, well, what is this for? And I would say, oh, a solar-powered airplane flying around the world. And they thought I was crazy, because again, you can't buy a part off of a shelf for this. You have to create it. So just like my mentality with the purse. The final job I had was riding the electric bike. So just as I said, my number one thing, riding an electrical, or electric bike down an airport runway. So I told you as the plane took off and landed, we had to be there to hold onto the wing and make sure it wasn't gonna fall from side to side. You guys might be thinking like, wow, what if you can't run fast enough? That's what the bikes were for. So the bikes would go 40 miles an hour, zoom up, and they would be able to be there. The person on the bike would be able to be there to hold the wing. So after this experience, I found my next passion with the future of mobility. And like I was saying, so I was standing on the airport runway in the United Arab Emirates, and I was thinking, wow, I can do anything. But I was also a little scared. You know, I was 23 years old, and I was thinking, will I ever have a job that's cooler than this? And it's pretty hard to top, right? But then I found that next passion with the future of mobility. Autonomous vehicles, shared vehicles, and connected vehicles are totally redefining the industry. And a lot of it is happening here in Pittsburgh. So I've now followed that passion to Carnegie Mellon where I'm getting my Master's of Information Systems Management and taking my first class in artificial intelligence in the fall. So I'm pretty excited about that. But today is not about me. I don't want any of you guys walking out of this room and saying, oh wow, Paige had a really cool job, that's great. Or Paige got to ride that camel. So fun. Today is about you. Because again, eight years ago, I was starting off my college career. And I don't know, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't have been ready for any of these things that were thrown at me. So today I want to share with you some tips that I picked up along the way for again, for you guys to be rockin' women that are ready to take on the world. Okay, so my first tip is that it is never too early to start using your voice. I had three incredible internships. How many of you guys are doing internships? Yeah, a lot of you guys, okay. So I had three incredible internships and each one I learned a lot and I gained a lot of confidence being a young engineer ready to enter the workforce. Of course, nothing comes without its challenges. So I remember in one of my internships, I would get back to my desk and I had voicemail after voicemail from male contract employees that would ask me to go to lunch, that would ask me if I would come see their car this weekend, if I would go on dates with them, all of this stuff. And the problem was it wasn't inappropriate, right? But it was constant. And I felt like it interfered with my ability to just come in and do my job. 
I talked to one of my friends about what I should do. And she said, well, Paige, I mean, you're friendly. You say hi to them. You're nice to them. Like, you can't act that way if you don't want them to think they can ask you out. And I was mad about this, right? Like, I'm a friendly person. Like, I don't want to have to ignore someone that's coming towards me down the hall. Just to, again, reaffirm this point that I am here to do a job. So I wasn't willing to change myself. But then I wasn't sure what to do. I thought about talking to someone at work about it, but I wasn't sure, like, oh, I'm, just a, I'm just an intern. Should I really rock the boat? And I remember thinking, okay, right now I'm just an intern, but once it's my full-time job, maybe then I'll say something. So I just dealt with it. And then I went back to Virginia Tech, and then later that year I went to a conference. And at that conference, I heard what became my favorite quote. And that is, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. I'm going to say that again because it confused me the first time I heard it. So the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. So if I see something going on that I'm not comfortable with, that doesn't align with my values, that I think is hurting somebody, and I don't say anything, then I'm kind of accepting that standard and I'm not driving change. So I decided at that moment I was never going to not use my voice again because I realized I would always find an excuse. First it was, I'm just an intern. Then I was just gonna be a new hire. Then I just got promoted. I moved a new company. You could always find an excuse not to use your voice, but there's no reason to be afraid. Oops, not yet. <laughs> so part of my willingness to use my voice, I think, is why I was selected for Solar Impulse. Because my company knew that I was somebody that wasn't afraid of standing up and sharing my opinion. And during my time with Solar Impulse, I had a lot of opportunities to use my voice. So like you heard, I was the youngest member of the team. I was the only female engineer and the only American on the ground crew. So I was definitely bringing the diversity. And there was one point when I was pulling that 5,100 pound airplane onto the runway and just thinking, wow, this is the coolest job ever. Like I'm in Hawaii, this, like it's 80 degrees, there's palm trees, and I'm working with this solar powered airplane. How cool. And then I heard someone say, oh, we have women pulling the airplane now. And then someone else said, yes, it's because we can pay them less. Yikes. <laughs> there is nothing more awkward than being right in the middle of a sexist joke that's made at your expense. <sighs> so through my head, all of these different things were going on. I was thinking, OK, I'm a little bit awkward like on this team. I'm trying to make friends. Should I really rock the boat? Is this maybe normal in European cultures? Am I overreacting? All of these things. And then I said, nope. Paige, you said you were never going to walk past the standard. Like I was mentioning with my quote, you, you have to use your voice. You have to say something. And so I did. I said, excuse me, I'm not comfortable with jokes or comments like that. Um, it's really inappropriate for a working setting, especially in 2016. And they were shocked. They started profusely apologizing and explaining, oh, no, 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 it's not personal. It's just a joke. And again, I don't know where 22-year-old Paige got her confidence, but I was like, <laughs> OK, yeah. I mean, again, I don't think it's funny, though. So now you know. Don't make those comments in front of me. And I felt so relieved because I thought, OK, if I don't say something now, is it going to happen again? And then I'm going to say something, or the third, fourth, fifth, tenth time? When would I put my foot down? Or am I just going to accept this new standard that I've accepted? So I've now been using my voice for change. Because once you start using your voice, it becomes addicting. Oops, why do I keep clicking forward? So, so now I've started using my voice for change, like I said. So I've entered into the autonomous vehicle world. And the, um, the whole kind of industry really needs more of a diversity presence. So I was at a conference in Silicon Valley, and I remember um, kind of thinking, oh, I feel a little, little out of place at this conference. 
And I couldn't really figure out why. But then I realized 36 out of the 36 speakers were male. So not just like three out of three, five out of five, 36 out of 36, and they couldn't find one woman? <sighs> I realized though, I'm part of the problem. There I was sitting in the audience. I didn't even think about volunteering. I'm not sure if I just didn't think I was ready, if I didn't think my work was important enough. I never considered it. But how am I going to ensure that this is a diverse group of people inventing the next generation of cars when I'm not willing to use my voice and stand up? So that's what I did. I walked out of the conference and picked up my phone and then decided to call the conference director for the autonomous vehicle conference I was attending the following week. And I wanted to know if any speakers dropped out and if I could take their place. So it's funny, side note here, my mom's in the audience and she has um, her own company where she plans conferences and d manages different associations. And so when I told her that I did this, she said, if someone ever did that to me, I would think they were absolutely crazy. I would not let them speak. And I would just think they were out of their mind. But this guy was shocked. But he said, actually, three people did drop out of the conference and were looking to refill their spots. So what do you want to talk about? I gave him three topics and said, you can choose. I'll send you a description of what each of those topics look like. And we can see what fits best. He slotted me into a time slot. And the only challenge was that I then had to go back to work and explain to my team how I am now presenting at an autonomous vehicle conference when I didn't really clear that with anybody. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Thankfully, though, they were supportive. And I realized, why make sure that just one woman is speaking at the conference? Why not make sure two women are, two women are speaking? I asked one of my good friends, Dr. Yanin Chen, who is a PhD chemist, if she wanted to co-present with me. And she said yes. So we went to Detroit. We got up, tag teamed this presentation. And afterwards, the conference director said, Paige, I thought it was so crazy that you called me, but I am so glad you did. Your presentation was one of the best of the entire conference. We want you to come back next year. It was great. I was so happy. And then I started thinking, oh my gosh, there could have been a billion things that went wrong. You know, the conference director could have thought I was crazy um, and like banned me from the conference. I don't know what could have happened. My work could have said like, no, you're not allowed to do this. You can't make those crazy decisions on the spot. We could have presented and been total failures, but none of that happened. I used my voice and I said, nope, I'm gonna make sure that there are some women at this conference presenting. And it worked out great. So don't be afraid of using your voice because more likely than not, it will end up being a success. All right, my second point, uncovering unconscious bias early and then nipping it in the bud. Now, how many of you guys know what the term unconscious bias means? Okay, we got some people. So unconscious bias is whenever somebody makes a judgment about you, but not really purposefully. They have a preconceived notion of what they think you can do. And I didn't really learn about this term until my first year out of college. And it's important to understand this term because it's important then to know why someone's treating you a certain way. Now, a couple more examples. So I remember, or I have to be the only person that studied electrical engineering that has been asked multiple times by my peers if electrical engineering is a blow-off major or if electrical engineering is just the easiest type of engineering. Every time that happened, I'd be like, uh, what? I, I mean, I don't think so. But I just thought it was so weird. Like, why am I getting this question over and over again? And it's because of unconscious bias. People saw how I looked, they saw how I talked, they were friends with me, and they just thought there has to be some catch for how Paige is able to complete this degree in four years. Now, a second question for you guys. Have you ever told somebody what you're looking, what you're studying, or what you want to do when you finish college and they're surprised? Raise your hand if you have. Wow, okay, a lot of you guys. Well, I remember that used to happen to me a lot too. And at first I was kind of, I thought it was kind of fun. I'm like, wow, I surprised them. 
But then I took a step back and was like, hold up. Why do you think I can't accomplish something? Like, why did you think I wouldn't be able to do that? So kind of a little combo with using your voice. When somebody said, wow, I didn't expect that, I started saying, oh, why? <laughs> Which was a little awkward, right? You know, I was like, why? And then they would be like, uh, uh, because really people don't know why. It's that unconscious bias where for whatever reason they see someone and they think like, oh, there's no way that that person could do that, but it's untrue. And if we're going to kind of build up our, you know, um, support system as women, there we go, build up our support system as women, we have to start acknowledging that unconscious bias exists and then correcting it, asking those questions, why? And getting people to uncover their own unconscious biases towards others. And this isn't important just to like make someone feel like, oh shoot, why did I think that? But it's important because we can't let other people limit what we think we can accomplish. My sophomore year at Virginia Tech, I remember I was working on this electrical engineering project with this, there were a couple guys in my group, and one of the guys said, Paige, when our classes get harder next semester, you're not gonna be able to do all of your, elect or your electives and extracurricular activities you're interested in. And I remember thinking like, what, no, like I'm so much more than an electrical engineer. I don't wanna just take classes, I wanna do it all. I wanted to be in a sorority, like I said, my engineering club, a design team, scuba diving. I wanted to carry around my hot pink toolbox and rock it. <laughs> but now I wasn't gonna be able to do that. Like it was gonna be too hard, my classes, and I was gonna have to give up these other things about myself. Again, another hold up moment. It's like, hold up, who the heck is that guy? He's in my classes. How does he know how hard our classes are gonna be next semester? How does he know what my capacity is to accomplish? Like, how does he know what I can and cannot handle? So I decided, just like my quote today, when someone tells you that you can't do something, go find someone that tells you you can. And that's what I did. So through building a support system, I was able to become the vice president of public relations for my sorority, the president of the electrical and computer engineering club, and found some time to take electives in business French. Now, that probably doesn't really make any sense, but it will. When I was applying for Solar Impulse, I told you I wrote about my solar panel phone charging purse, but I also, but the project was also looking for someone that was an electrical engineer, check, that had some background in public relations, check, and had some experience with the French language since the team mainly spoke French, check. I fit all of those boxes because I didn't let people tell me what I could and could not do. If I would have just listened to this random guy that said, you won't be able to do all this stuff, Paige, who knows if I would have been perfectly qualified for this job or if someone else would have been better suited. So again, you're gonna get so much advice. And of course, a lot of the advice is gonna be great. And you have to make sure though you're filtering the advice and you're doing what feels right to you. You can't let people limit you based on what they think you can accomplish. All right, and my final point. So I was touching on this a little bit too, and that is support is the greatest key to success. It is so much easier to push through, to use your voice, to ask why, all of these different things when you have a support system around you. I didn't really realize how important support was though until I was on the Solar Impulse project. Now I'm gonna tell you a story about the electric bicycles. Remember those really cool electric bicycles? Every time I would get that sheet, I would hope that I was assigned to ride the electric bike. I would be sitting there crossing my fingers and like, please, please, please let me be on that bike. And one day it finally happened. I was like, yes, I'm gonna look so cool. Again, I posted on Instagram and I was just ready. I was like, I can't wait to do this. I walked over to the shiny bikes they were pedal assisted, so I had to pedal, and then with the um, combo of the electric motor, then it would take me 40 miles an hour. So I had someone explain to me how to use the bikes, and again, what the bikes were, were I had to follow the wing and be there just in case the runners weren't quick enough. So I was told to be on um, the runway, 
And then as the propeller started to spin on the plane, I was supposed to make three big circles to build up momentum. There were two of the bikes, so when I saw the other bike making the circles, I did the same. So it was one circle, two circle, three circle, and then we zoomed down the runway. I was like, great, like I'm doing this. Like, again, this is the dream. I'm in Hawaii. I'm riding this cool bike. Until I looked over and the other bike wasn't in tandem with me. They were way down the runway. I thought, oh shoot. <laughs> so I pedaled, I pedaled, I pedaled, and I realized my gears were in reverse. <sighs> I was horrified. It was like my moment where I was just like, yes, this is gonna be great, and I failed. So I made it to the plane, and my friends already started kind of poking fun at my failure, like, oh, like you don't know how to ride a bike, which shouldn't have really been that big of a like insult, but it was really affecting me. And the head of the ground crew asked what happened, and I explained the gear situation. And I just hoped I would have a chance to ride this bike again. We were in Hawaii and we were doing test flights. So two days later, I was thrilled to see that I was assigned the bike again. And this time it was going to be a landing at night. And I was going to do the exact same thing, but be on the side of the runway, make my three circles, and then zoom out onto the runway. So I went over to the bike. I made sure that the gears were situated properly because I wasn't letting that happen again. And I was ready. I was like, I got this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finally do this. So I was testing my bike over and over, turning it on, turning it off, everything just to make sure that everything was going to be perfect. So we get out onto the runway and the plane came in sight. I made one circle, two circles, three circles, and then my bike shut off. The other bike zooms down the runway at 40 miles an hour, and there I am going 10. I failed for the second time. As I was slowly pedaling to the airplane, I was hoping that I would never reach it. I couldn't face the team. They already, again, were kind of poking fun at my first failure. I was feeling so awkward because I was new to the project. I couldn't really showcase my personality in a different language. Just all of these things. And now I couldn't ride a bike. <sighs> So I made it to the plane and everyone was silent. The head of the ground crew said, so what happened this time? I explained that the bike shut off, this and that, but I just, you know, I felt like he was done hearing excuses. And then some of my friends said, Paige, maybe you shouldn't be assigned to ride the bike again. And I went back to my house got into my bedroom, closed the door, laid on my bed, and bawled my eyes out. Again, you guys can laugh about this because I am telling you and confessing in front of a large group of people that I was bawling my eyes out because I was not able to ride a bicycle. It was, yeah, it was crazy. But I was thinking, why is this affecting me so much? It's not like I'm scared of failing. I always jump at these different opportunities. Why was this one incident causing me so much stress? And then I realized it were those words, maybe you shouldn't ride the bike again. You know, I was used to being a part of a culture where when I would fail or mess up, people would say, don't worry, you got this. Like, you'll get it next time. If you need any help, I'll help you. But that's not what I had. People were saying, maybe you just shouldn't try again. So somehow the next morning, I dragged myself out of my bed got to the hangar where we were then doing a debriefing session about the flight the last night. And I noticed everyone was pointing fingers at each other, calling each other out and saying, you did this wrong and you did this wrong. And I realized it's not me that doesn't have the supportive culture here. It's everyone. So when it came to be my time to speak, I said, I want to thank Stefan for explaining how to work the electric bikes. I really appreciated your support. Next time, I know I'll get it. I also want to thank Richard for helping me with the mobile hangar setup. I want to thank Owen for helping me with the mobile kitchen. I really appreciate all of the support. And the tone completely changed. People were shocked. They were like, a compliment, what? So I kind of gestured to the person next to me, like, okay, your turn. And that person started 
started off with something positive too. They said, oh, going off of Paige's point, I also wanted to say this. I found my role on the team. You don't always have to be the one scoring the winning baskets, coming up with that huge idea that's going to revolutionize the world. The most important thing for you to do on any team you're on is be a good team member. And that was my job. I wanted to make sure that we had this supportive culture where if one of us were going to fall, the others would be there to catch. And so I have to let you guys know that, in fact, I did ride the bike properly one time. Can't leave you guys hanging there. When the plane was leaving from Hawaii on the way to California, I was assigned the bike one more time. And I was like, I am proving to myself that I can do this bike. I am not messing up a third time. So it was four in the morning, we were taken off, and I made one circle, and the sunrise was coming up above the Hawaiian mountains, two circles, I saw the wind blowing in the palm trees, three circles flew down the runway at 40 miles an hour. It was the best feeling ever. Something as simple as not being able to ride a bike rattled my confidence. But that, and following that, and understanding why, helped me find my role on the team. So having a strong support system is so important. And being a part of someone's support system is equally important. You guys are all really lucky that you have this group already. And you can support each other. And you can make each other stronger, better women. Now, you're going to face challenges throughout your life. There's no doubt about that. You don't know what they're going to be, just like I had no idea that I was going to be working with solar-powered airplanes and self-driving cars, but you guys are all going to be ready because you're doing exactly what you should be to ensure that you're going to enter the real world after college and be well-rounded, high-achieving young women. If you use your voice, if you uncover unconscious bias early and then nip it in the bud and then find a support system, you'll be able to accomplish anything. Now, if you ever need someone to say you got this, I'm your girl. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I have a website. And just like I said, I've known how difficult it is to push past people saying you can't. And it's so much easier to say, watch me, I got this, whenever you have someone saying you can do it. So I'm expecting big things from you all. And if you ever need my help, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.